Wayne, Indiana, a city that has gained national recognition. It's been designated as an all-America city. It's been called one of our nation's best communities to raise children. And some officials ranked Fort Wayne among the most livable cities in the nation. These accolades are deserved in some respects, but at least one ingredient increasingly robs some people in this mid-sized Midwestern community of a basic human need. Food, fresh food, fruits and vegetables, the kind of food that enables people to live healthy lives. It's a simple ingredient, yet one so detrimental to life. The USDA defines a food desert by the distance to a full grocery store, and a full grocery store has to have produce, they have to have dairy, they have to have meat, and they have to have grains um, to be considered a full grocery. So specialty stores do not count, and it's also um, by income of the neighborhood. So they judge it by access to healthy food, basically. So in Fort Wayne, we have five zip codes that are defined as a food desert. And when we broke that down further, there's actually 13 census tracts that are qualified per the USDA requirements to be called a food desert. And that really just means they have very little access to healthy food. So what that translates into in Fort Wayne and Allen County is 110,000 residents live in a food desert. So that's a third of our population that have low access to healthy food. Health officials, local experts, and historians agree that this issue, the lack of healthy food, affects the very health of people who live in food desert communities. Are you to get in the truck or the Others have a hard time getting any food at all. They are what is called food insecure, lacking a consistent supply of adequate food. Come on down. They wait in long lines for free giveaways and for subsidized farm market programs. Simply put, for many, food, especially healthy food, is just too hard to come by. Moving away from individually owned grocery stores uh, that are nestled within communities to more regional uh, grocery stores that are part of big chains. Uh, has made it so that um, a lot of the establishment, the grocery store establishments that were traditionally embedded in our community are no longer here. And so what does that, re what has that been replaced with? And so uh, you can see that we have a, um, a steady supply of gas stations with convenience stores attached to them. Uh, we have a steady supply of liquor stores uh, with not necessarily food attached to them, but some grab-and-go stuff. Um, we have an increase uh, with those gas stations, um, local restaurants, uh, some uh, dine and dash kind of facilities, uh, not sit-down establishments. And so the proliferation of other retail entities have uh, come in and took the place of what I would think of as the grocery store uh, outlets or the, in, the independent or the individually owned grocery stores that used to proliferate within our community. And so that's left the community to think about health issues when we were really thinking about the way in which um, the persistent levels of health um, disparities in the black community, black and brown communities, associated with chronic illnesses around diabetes, heart issues, uh, high blood pressure, uh, and the like. Much of what Americans eat really is uh, risky for their health, uh, whether they know it or not. Uh, we have really unprecedented levels of chronic disease in our nation. And if you add in then a financial barrier and a barrier to access food, we are really um, creating more chronic disease disproportionately in key neighborhoods. So we need to pull back and really think about that. And with more and more food insecurity happening, we have to think about what is happening. Our adults, um, they have a higher level of chronic disease, diabetes, heart disease, 
uh, risk of stroke, obesity. And our kids especially, have they have delayed growth, uh, impairment. They might have more chronic disease like anemia or asthma. They might have more issues with anxiety, aggression, and they also have, they struggle in school a little bit when they're food insecure. So if you know what really does prompt disease and the environmental effect, factors that affect um, people getting access to healthy food, you know what, it is key that we as communities work on access and, and create um, an easier access to the very life-sustaining foods they need. So a lot of times you hear that um, where you live, zip code-wise, is more important than your genetic code. And the reason being is that, again, the environmental constraints are big. There may not be a grocery store, there may not be a farm market, uh, there may not be bus lines or transportation to your local doctor, so there's access issues that there may not be safe neighborhoods to exercise. So, um, so health becomes quickly impaired and um, we know that our neighborhoods um, by and large are suffering from higher rates of chronic disease like diabetes and heart disease and they have shorter lifespans. Uh, and so we need to really address health equity in a big way. April Erksleben recently earned a bachelor's degree in human services. She was working at a local Burger King until she could find her dream job helping people in a local shelter or clinic. She lives with her two youngest children in the 46803 zip code where plenty of obstacles can hinder healthy living. It's all about the location. There is, there's nothing right here in the area where I'm at. Even if I want to go to Walmart, I still gotta drive 10 minutes, at least 10, 15 minutes at least to get to a grocery store a real grocery store. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. If you want to save some money, but if you want to spend $30 on your family's meal, go ahead and hit the corner store up, go ahead and hit up Dollar General, and they're going to charge you. And yes, yeah. Even the cost of gas and transportation can contribute to the lack of food access. I drive all the way to work on the other side of town. So when I get over here to this side of town, it's like, okay, I know I got to save my gas to get to work. Let me go to the closest spot to do what I need to do because I know work is important. Odalis Gonzalez was on maternity leave after birthing a newborn daughter. She had been working in a senior living facility. She lives now with her family in the 46806 zip code. She likes the summertime in Fort Wayne because she can shop at local farm markets and get quality produce at low prices. This is my first year in the market and it being so impressive and so helpful for my um, family. It, I got five kids and um, you know, I have to feed in and the good way you feeding your kids is coming to the market. You got everything fresh and everything good for the kids. This is the salad that I made it for the farm. It's lettuce, it's spinach, it's um, cucumbers, um, radish, um, I got corn. You know, I got really, really um, healthy and really quality for eat. Mm -hmm. It's not sucky, it's not too, um, too watery, it's, it's in the points that you really want to eat. Over there, they offer the um, fruit as well, they, my kids love it. And sometimes I'm uh, teaching the kids, when you want something sweet, try the um, switch for fruit. They make it more better for you, you got fiber, you got your vitamins, and it's still your belly full. The candies only give you, be honest, calories, mm -hmm. and your sugar is coming up. Healthy is, um, it got two ways for me. One, for the way my grandma showed me and teach me how to eat. And the second one is for um, healthy. For it's, it's coming a lot of illness in my family like diabetes, blood pressure, heart problems. Uh, me right now they have a thyroid problem, arthritis, and you know all that kind of um, illness that you know eat the right um, way later the future couple years more is can affecting you. And that's I've been teaching my kids to eat healthy that's when they be more older, they're not being suffered much that like us going to suffer.
Health contributes to so much more than our physical bodies. It's a major factor in our economic stability. You may have insurance, you may be a part of the working poor, and you may have some, uh, some insurance, but you better not get sick. Uh, and if you have these kinds of chronic issues, it can actually take you out of the labor market uh, prematurely. Uh, so you have people in our community who are in their mid to late 50s having to exit uh, the, lab the labor economy because of health issues. And then what happens uh, to that family's income the kind of social economic status of that family then declines because the wage earner is out of the labor economy. These things are not in, disconnected in my mind. One here has, you know, Angela Leon is 45 years old. She says she left her waitress job and her home after being diagnosed with cancer and having to undergo treatment and surgeries. Today, she is the caretaker for a friend. They live in a motel. It's not easy, especially being living here. You know, just the food selections, you have to, you know, try your best to make sure you eat healthy and not, a lot of people don't, you know, like I said, we're going about the crock pot, we got the like, skillet. Otherwise, a lot of people just eat microwave meals and they're not healthy, they're expensive, you know? I can take almost anything down here on this shelf between the canned vegetables, the, the chicken, the noodles, and make it, mix anything up and make something. I have, you ready? Mm -hmm. I got like here, canned chicken, canned tuna, got box meals. I've got all kinds of canned vegetables and fruits. So, I mean, you know, or just take like some mashed potatoes and mix up, a can of chicken and some gravy. We have a Kroger's here that's about three miles away. Um, then Coldwater Walmart and Apple Glen Walmart are both about two and a half miles away from us. We are on the bus route, thankfully. Um, fortunately, we do have a vehicle, but when we don't, there's always somebody around that you can get a ride from or, you know, try not to have to walk too far <laughs> to make sure that we get food. Food deserts and families living without enough food are not issues unique to Fort Wayne. People and communities nationwide experience these same challenges. But it wasn't always this way. Grocery stores with well-stocked produce sections were once plentiful in local neighborhoods. The question is, where did the fresh food go and why? When I was reminiscing about what was happening with food, you know, 50, 60 years ago, I realized that we were not in the food desert, we were in a food oasis. Okay, from where I live, which was just a few blocks from here, we went to a. There were a couple of little mom pa grocery stores. One was a block down our own street. Brownies stayed in this area for for probably 40, 50 years. Behind us, we could take a little cut through the backyard and across uh, Eliza Street to White's grocery store. And uh, I remember at both of those grocery stores, we used to be able to, what they call, run a tab. You could run in, pick up what you needed, they'd say, put it on the account, and you know make the account clear at the end of the, the month when your checks came in and things of that nature. So those are where we, we got most of our groceries you know, on a regular basis. But we also did our larger shopping just across the street here, where U-Haul is now, used to be an A&P. Many shared Denise's experiences with fresh food growing up in Fort Wayne. I am a native of Fort Wayne. I've been here ever since I was a year old. And I can remember as a child the different um, stores that were more available. I can remember Maloli's Grocery. I can remember um, Kaplan's even on the corner of Lewis and Lafayette. I can remember uh, the Three Sisters and their, their little family market that they had. But it seemed, in, when I was growing up, we had access to food in our, in our neighborhoods much more than today. And the other thing is we had stores that were larger as well as stores that were smaller, but we also had a lot of locally owned stores. Today, it seems everything that we have in terms of food provision is 
given by someone that's from corporate, from somewhere out of the city. So even the money that we're spending so freely on food, which we must have to live, it really is going out of our communities very, very quickly. The shift from neighborhood stores to corporations happened for myriad reasons. If you think about uh, residential patterns, uh, where you would have black communities or a, a neighborhood that is bound in certain kinds of ways geographically on the south side of town, central side of the, centrally located in the city, those would be po populated by certain ethnic populations. And so what marketers would do is would target the products to those particular neighborhoods. And so that's called segmented marketing. So segmented marketing, for a while after um, in, in the 1950s really took off, right? It really took off. But as um, patterns started to, uh, residential patterns started to be shaken up when desegregation came in and the rise of the black middle class and the rise of the middle class in general in, in America itself, then those patterns of residential patterns started to uh, create new marketing designs in advertisement and in product location. So what I mean by that is as you start to see uh, the success of the civil rights movement uh, 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 and then the, then the disaggregation of black classes from a, a concentrated um, neighborhood itself. So for example, at Fort Wayne in South Central, in the central part of the city, you would have a congestion of economic classes uh, within the central city location. So. Uh, some of us grew up with uh, around uh, teachers in the, in the schools. Uh, Sister uh, Miss Green was a teacher in the elementary school. She lived right down the street from me. She was the elementary school teacher. And then you would have the doctor who would live not too far outside of the, the community. And so other, but when the segregation and redlining and housing, housing patterns shifted uh, and the creation of suburbia, right? So you had uh, not just um, white flight outside, uh, outside of these kinds of inner city communities, of uh, central city communities, but you had uh, black middle class who were also in a position to follow um, the market, the housing market, the, uh, and all of the advantages of, uh, that are associ were associated with suburbia, better schools, uh, better retail outlets, uh, hospitals, uh, shopping areas, all of that followed that trend towards the creation of suburbia. Those corporate retail magnets also saw those patterns shift and what they started to do is to start to target, move away from segmented marketing, targeting products to particular segmented communities to a regionally focused marketing strategy that would, that traced the movement and the growth of suburbia itself. We hear a lot about food deserts, and, and one of the things I hear people say, well, why don't they just move where the grocery stores are or things of that nature? You have to realize that this was not a desert even 30 years ago, okay? One by one, you would see certain things begin to happen in the community that foretold the change as it was coming about, okay? I call it a drip by drip by drip sort of scenario, okay? Most of those stores that I mentioned were locally owned and operated. So that meant that the decision makers were part of this community. These were family businesses. They passed down from one generation to the next generation. And somewhere along the line, probably closer in the 70s and 80s, that next generation did not want to stick around here. They did not want to stay in that family business. They were looking for other sorts of things to uh, find their way in the world. So the business may have closed 
down because there was no one to take it on. But at, that was happening here and it was happening elsewhere in the community and also in the rural uh, uh, area. Big box stores saw an opportunity to get their foot in the door for uh, starting a business that they could control and operate. Many ask the question, did racism play a role in the proliferation of food deserts in Fort Wayne? Sometimes racism is greenism. It's like what makes money makes a decision. And underlying what makes money is probably a bit of racism. It was almost like de facto segregation. It just happened to be that other decisions that had been made also affected these little stores and um, the, the shopping patterns that came about. For example, when um, just before I was born, uh, there was still officially um, redlining and de facto segregation in housing. My father actually, after World War II, was, he was a, a, a naval vet, came back to Fort Wayne with mustard out pay, war bonds and things of that nature. And in the late 1940s, just as the federal government was declaring uh, those racial lines for housing um, illegal, my father was able to purchase land and build the first home by an African-American family, new home in this community. Like I said, just, just a few blocks from here. So for a long time in Fort Wayne, African-Americans tended to live along the railroad tracks, maybe four blocks one way or the other, but not that far. And primarily on the west side of, of, of town out uh, by uh, Lindenwood Cemetery in a place called Westfield. So even though what we're standing in now looks like uh, an urban community, 50, 60 years ago, you could see whites living along the two thoroughfares, blacks living basically the, between the two tracks. I distinctly remember at my age uh, when blacks were just beginning to move south of Pontiac and then south of Rudisil. So that change has been just in my lifetime. So, is it racial? Is it not? It's hard to say because they're so intertwined with, with how things were, were pulled together. Today, grassroots organizations and more organized efforts through government agencies and healthcare institutions strive to meet demands for healthy food within underserved communities. I'm excited to announce that our store, Utopian Community Grocery, has finally opened for our community. We think it's very important at this time in our lives for us to return to people taking ownership of their own health and making sure that we provide for ourselves healthy food. So we are here to do that. At least in this community, we want to provide healthy, fresh food all year round. So that's one of the major goals for Utopian Community Grocery. We are here in a food desert. Um, we are 3.1 miles away from the nearest grocery store. The food availability that we have here is really up to some of those corner stores and those small, almost like gas station type stores. Um, and this project was really started because the city of Fort Wayne recognized that there's not affordable produce available here on a consistent, persistent presence. And they wanted to be able to be um, a source of affordable, fresh produce here in the Renaissance Point neighborhood. Years ago, we had decided that the city owned the vacant um, buyer station there on Winter Street, and it seemed like the perfect location to offer some sort of a um, 
food resource in the neighborhood, in the Renaissance Point neighborhood that we were focused on working in. Um, and so we used some of the federal resources to um, renovate the building and also set up the actual um, garden operation behind it. When we first started this project, we, we started asking what the community wants um, because we recognized that um, we weren't getting that involvement that we really wanted at the beginning. We weren't getting the engagement that we wanted from the community. Um, and this was a community center. It, like, that's what Johnny May had started with her legacy was making this a community center. Um, and when we started asking the community what they wanted is they wanted a safe place to be able to come and exist and um, have community and meet their neighbors. Um, they really just, they wanted that community and we want to be able to provide that for them. Um, so most of what we do really hinges on that desire of the community to want a safe place. Um, and it's shown too on when we have the markets on Fridays, we, when the kids get out of school, they come here, they play football, they play frisbee, we give them popsicles, we, we walk around the gardens with them. But it's an opportunity for us to give them a safe place to exist. Um, we, we know that the, a lot of parents, they don't allow the children to go anywhere else without them except for here. This is a really great project for the city of Fort Wayne and for Purdue Extension to be able to leverage some of those really great dollars and bring a good resource to the community. Um, understanding that like this is really this is a way to support we're we're not making money off of this we we really just want to be here to support the community because it's such a great community there's so many wonderful assets here in the pot you know I'm thankful to be able to live so close to the garden where I'm able to get my fresh vegetables you know the yeah, garden is that. very good for my family we have haven't been eating no fresh squash or zucchini, wouldn't think about buying it from the grocery store until I started shopping at the garden. We have fresh greens. We just had fresh greens on, what day was that y'all? Just the other day. Uh, when I barbecued like on Sunday, we had fresh collards and I did very well with those, might I say. Um, right now I have a roast going where I have zucchini from the garden. I have um, onions from the garden. Um, let's see what else I put in there from the peppers from the garden, carrots from the garden. Yes, the garden is great. The garden is helping the South Side community eat healthy. Other than that, we probably wouldn't be eating as healthy as we are. You know, very thankful for the garden. It helps out a lot. The HEAL initiative, which stands for Healthy Eating Active Living, is another major effort. It is also one of the longest standing and consistent the city has seen. It involves pop-up farm markets in food desert neighborhoods during the summer and early fall, as well as grant funding for cooking classes in underserved communities. We know for a fact you are what you eat. So we know that um, eating healthy foods like fresh produce, grains, those type of things, has a direct impact on the rate of diabetes, obesity, hypertension, heart disease, but what it really translates in for our youth is behavioral problems. So you have a higher rate of ADHD and behavioral problems because they get addicted to sugar and preservatives and all those things that really are kind of toxic for the body. O'Dallas, who shopped at Hill Farm Markets, says it's more cost effective to eat healthy because she doesn't have to pay for medications to overcome illnesses that could have been prevented. The money I'm spending and the farmer um, is not being related for any meds, any healthy problems, but I'm being eating the right way. And they have been eating the wrong way, I pay double and uh, it's not making any sense. Many of the farm market programs, including these and others, close in late fall, leaving people like April, O'Dallas, and Angela with fewer fresh food options. But some efforts, 
such as year-round farm markets, community harvest food bank, associated churches, and the Utopian Grocery are striving to close the gap during the winter months. Really, our involvement has been, you know, f you know, funding in other entities uh, that, you know, can get food access to people who maybe don't have it. Public transportation uh, investments in transportation uh, services and those sorts of things. And and now I think we want to have a, perhaps a more more direct uh, involvement. We've changed uh, a little bit how we've operated. I think Johnny May. Uh, farm in terms of having you know direct access to the food, but also education on how to how to use it. And I think you know we also aspire to be directly involved in um, you know developing a grocery um, in in the area um, in the southeast food desert area to you know, you know have fresh foods, meats, and, and you know everything you know that people would want want to have uh, from a grocery store. So I think you know our involvement um, will become even more direct. Um, in the future. As a way to address this food desert is, you know, having, having the fresh, you know, supply of food and, and transportation is a big part of that and that's one of the things that creates a food desert and so, you know, having, having food available in close proximity, a walkable, you know, whether a 15 minute type of neighborhood um, is important to address that gap. And so we, you know, heard about um, uh, a grocery that they, that was developed in Toledo um, with public sector, private sector partnership. Um, and so we've gone there and, you know, looked at it and they've basically have a proven model um, of how, how a grocery can, can be, you know, developed and constructed, if you will, and implemented in a way that um, meets, meets the needs, but also, you know, can ultimately achieve, you know, from a financial or business perspective, you know, um, uh, some sort of sustainability and so we have been working with the folks involved um, with the Toledo model we've hired them and are you know looking at their model and actually beginning to put those pieces together um, including you know getting partners uh, looking for funding looking for a building you know location and those sorts of things um, so we're really excited about the progress we've made and and um, you know have have every uh, every hope that, that it will become coming a reality. In today's literature, we know that the American style of eating, which is loaded with uh, undesirable fats, refined carbohydrates, sugar, a lot of fried food, a lot of sodium, just keeps this vicious cycle going of, un of unhealthy people and it is getting to the point where it's unsustainable as far as healthcare costs in our nation it creates shorter lifespans um, and we know that you know in pockets of our community that don't have access and knowledge and resources for healthy food that it's even worse uh, so um, there is a big connection between diet and disease they're powerfully linked in fact it's probably one of the most important lifestyle habits that people can really look into to change teach people about how to cook healthily, healthy and with the, you know, uh, do some cultural changing. Uh, listen, um, culture will eat strategy every day. So you could think about these strategies all you want to. You can uh, talk about, you know, embedding uh, grocery stores or food outlets or, um, you know, farmers markets and all of these kinds of uh, ac access to uh, incre uh, improved quality of food if you want to, but culture will undermine all of that. If we like ribs, if we fry our chicken, if we like to batter our food with, um, uh, you know, flour and dip it and fly it in deep grease and uh, turkey drumsticks, and that's a part of what we think about culture, right? If we think that's what black cuisine and black celebration, celebratory moments are, are uh, that unless you are make a change in the culture, all of your strategies will fail. The positive way of looking at it is that now you know what you're really up against, right? Because at the end of the day, 
the interest, if you just want to say this, naked interest, interest of government is you need citizens who are healthy. And you need healthy citizens because they provide the labor market. And healthy citizens in the labor market provide the tax ba ba uh, basis for your survival of your community. It, if all of the infrastructure of the, and the resources of the city government is, are undermined because you have unhealthy citizens who cannot participate in the labor market, then what you have is one single in industry that becomes dependent on sick people. That's the healthcare industry, right? So the healthcare industry is dependent on sick people who, are not, who themselves are not contributing economically. That's a recipe for a disastrous city, right? You can't build an economy or a city on that. So it's in the, the interest of the city to actually make some kind of intervention so that it can uh, have the kind of citizenry that it can go out and then have entrepreneurship and then all of the kind of development and the opportunities for advancement and forward progress can happen and be actually resourced by the human capital that you have. Poor, sick citizens, a poor, sick city. And I think we're looking at serving a role as convener, um, participant, um, whatever, whatever gaps we need to fill is what we're going to do. I started out talking about what happened to make this happen. It was like a drip, drip, drip sort of thing. And I really think it's going to be a drip, drip, drip sort of thing to make a turnaround. Uh, I think you've got to start with things in your own backyard. You live here, grow your own food where you can. If you have a plot of, of ground, you know, in your backyard, you, there's some things that you can do now to grow tomatoes and, and um, um, uh, uh, herb gardens and things right where you are. Uh, invest in community gardens, like we're doing it with Fort Wayne Community Schools, so that we have the food, fruits and vegetables locally produced here. It also teaches another generation how to do agricultural, you know, as a, a commodity and as a, as a business. I think we have to educate ourselves so that we know what our options are and make better choices uh, when we are buying foods and eating less processed uh, food or fast food in, in our days. I think that we have to learn how to partner with those people who we didn't want to move into our neighborhood but are here and with the money. So we want to fight having more dollar stores or liquor stores or, or um, gas stations, but the ones that are already here, you've got to make them be part of the neighborhood. Have them work with you on perhaps doing a farmer's market uh, day in their parking lots and be active and, and walk the community. A lot of times we just drive through. We don't think in terms of what's happening in that. But just as I'm walking with a rollator right now, it's nice to know what the impediments are to others that, that have needs. So you can speak up with city council or other elected officials about what needs to happen. When you're walking in the neighborhood, you will see pockets of things that are happening, whether it's the gardens that I mentioned, or sometimes those little candy stores that we used to call them that would sell things. Perhaps they're selling cigarettes, we don't know, probably, but we'll see. But give them an opportunity to make a difference by also offering, you know, um, apples and oranges and, and, and a banana for a dollar or something like that. So we're just going to have to start drip by drip with what we have. That will be a magnet to grow other things and other things. And we'll, we'll see that we may not have the oasis that we used to have, but we won't be a desert forever. Time will change. <laughs>